Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schatz. On the show tonight. We are glad to imagine a new day under new leadership. The CEO of Chicago's Park District resigns. Could more changes be coming? We're certainly going in the right direction. That's the good news. We have to just be careful that we don't prematurely declare victory. With COVID cases dropping nationwide, is the U.S. finally reaching herd immunity? I am honestly getting ready to be fired. Airline employees refusing COVID vaccines could lose their jobs. What impact could that have on the airline industry? Who are the super agers? Local researchers just secured a $20 million grant to study people over 80 with high functioning cognitive ability. Northwestern University names its first female president. That and more cranes, Chicago Business News. Fastball slider, curveball mostly. Leori Garcia sends one a deep center field. And the White Sox have taken the lead in game three. A raucous night on the south side, and the White Sox have new life. We look at what's ahead. We make the best potato chip cookie. We visit a Lincoln Square Bakery that also offers life skills and job training to adults with different abilities. To be able to see us representing and to see, you know, people that look like them. And a professional softball player on her journey and how she hopes to inspire other Latinas to go pro. But first, some of today's top stories. While today's federal holiday is still Columbus Day, in honor of Italian explorer Christopher Columbus, many Native American nations and supporters are still advocating for an Indigenous Peoples Day. For over 500 years, Indigenous people have been fighting for their survival, their land, and their rights. And each October, when Columbus is honored, it further diminishes and erases Native people, their history, and their culture. Unfortunately, it also is, was the beginning of genocide against Native people, uh, transatlantic slavery, and the dehumanizing effect of colonization. Organizers opened a news conference this morning with a song from the Pawnee Nation. The group is calling on Cook County commissioners to pass a measure renaming Columbus Day as Indigenous Peoples Day and Reconciliation Day. Meanwhile, the Joint Civic Committee of Italian Americans stepped off its annual Columbus Day parade in downtown Chicago. After the parade, JCCIA President Ron Onesti addressed what he sees as the need to return the Christopher Columbus statues. We concur that narratives need to be broadened and dialogue must ensue. More stories about all our histories need to be told and amends need to be made. We want to learn the good, the bad, the ugly truths about our own American history. But what cannot be done is to replace what is perceived to be a one-sided narrative with another one-sided narrative. Among the floats and marchers were a number of organizations representing other ethnic backgrounds, including Polish and Thai. Onesti says the Columbus statues were established to celebrate the contributions of Italian Americans and that the statue at Arago Park on the near west side was paid for by funds collected from the Italian American community. He also called for a conversation between both the Italian American and Native American communities. White Sox fans will have to wait one more day for game four of the American League Division Series against the Houston Astros. This after last night's dramatic four-hour win keeping the Sox hopes alive. Today's game was postponed because of rain in the forecast. The teams are scheduled to play tomorrow afternoon at 1.07. Tickets and parking passes will automatically transfer. Gates to the park open at 11 a.m. Today's game was supposed to start with Carlos Rodon pitching for the Sox as the Southsiders need another win against Houston to stay alive. Down 2-5 to five in this best of five series. We'll have more about what's ahead for the Sox later in the program. And the Chicago Sky head into game two of the WNBA Finals on Wednesday with a one game to nothing lead over the Phoenix after beating the Mercury 91-77 to on Sunday. Game two is Wednesday night in Phoenix after, again, after the Sky beat Mer the Mercury just last night. Meanwhile, Mayor Lori Lightfoot and Phoenix Mayor Kate Gallego have entered a friendly wager over whose team wins. Lightfoot betting some brown sugar bakery, half acre beer, and coffee from uh, 57th Street. Gallego, she says she'll pony up goods from women owned businesses in Phoenix if the Mercury loses. Up next, when the country might reach a long awaited milestone in the fight against COVID, stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols. 
the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. In recent weeks, the number of COVID cases and hospitalizations has dropped dramatically across the country. While at the beginning of September, the U.S. was averaging around 160,000 new cases each day, that figure is now just over 90,000 and trending downwards. So is the nation finally approaching herd immunity? Here's what the nation's leading infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, told CNN on Sunday. It's certainly going in the right direction. That's the good news. And, and hopefully it's going to continue to go in that trajectory downward. But we have to just be careful that we don't prematurely declare victory in many respects. We still have around 68 million people who are eligible to be vaccinated that have not yet gotten vaccinated. And joining us now to share their expertise are Dr. Emily Landon, an infectious disease specialist at UChicago Medicine, where she leads its infection control and prevention efforts. And Dr. Evelyn Figueroa, professor of clinical family medicine at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. Dr. Figueroa is also director of the UIC Family Medicine Residency Program and executive director of the Pilsen Food Pantry. And we're thankful that both of these doctors made time for us tonight. Uh, Dr. Landon, let's start with you, please. So nationwide COVID cases have been steadily declining in recent weeks. Do you think this Delta variant wave of the virus has it peaked um, or is there another resurgence on the way? Yeah, I think that the summer wave has peaked and I think that a lot of places that didn't have as much immunity because of vaccination have now achieved some natural immunity through infection. But there are still a lot of pockets of the country that were relatively protected by immunization that are still eligible to have a a wave of COVID come through this winter. And I think people up in the northern half of the country, areas, if you live in a community that doesn't have very much vaccination, you're probably at risk for a little bit of a bump. Hopefully we're not gonna see anything like with the surges that we saw in the southern half of the country this summer, but that's really gonna be determined by how well immunized your community is. And Dr. Figueroa, so we know just over 65% of the U.S. population has had at least one vaccine dose. Uh, for people over the age of 12, that figure is actually 76%. And as Dr. Landon said, that's, you know, between vaccinations and those who've developed resistance by actually having survived an infection. Uh, are we close to reaching herd immunity? Well, I'm certainly not the herd immunity expert. Um, that would be Dr. Landon and Dr. Fauci. Um, but we are um, we are improving and and get and making gains and strides in treating folks with COVID. One of the really big opportunities for us is just to really ensure that even though we're talking about these national rates of COVID vaccination in Illinois, um, folks um, are below the national rate, so we are we are de decreased uh, up by a few percentage points. And that to not forget that that's an average, which means that some communities may be as low as 20% where other ones are over 90%. So it's really getting into all of the communities and trying to myth bust as much as we can. And Dr. Landon, I'll throw that question to you as well. How close are we to herd immunity? Well, some places probably are already there, but the problem is you can't just be a little herd immunity in a whole nation that's very heterogeneous. And as this pandemic goes on, things get more and more hyper-local. And so it comes down to if you surround yourself with a lot of vaccinated people, you're probably going to be in good shape. And if you're vaccinated as well, but if you're the only vaccinated person in a sea of unvaccinated, you're going to get exposed to COVID over and over and over again. You're probably be more likely to get a breakthrough infection. So it really comes down to the nitty gritty of is that person sitting across from you or next to you or near you vaccinated too. Dr. Figueroa, are we still seeing the huge racial disparities in the way communities are being impacted by the virus? Absolutely. Essential workers are still essential. And um, and a lot of people have had to go back to work. Um, we know that uh, locally different um, different social service programs have been changing. Um, uh, retire, um, sorry, unemployment benefits have expired for lots of folks. So they, they have to go back into settings that are not always ideal. Um, I do think that the Latinx population has caught up um, to the general population nationally, but there still is uh, quite a bit of lag in the African-American community. And I, I take care of a lot of African-American folks at UI Health, so it's very distressing to me. 
Absolutely. Um, and Dr. Landon, as you were just saying, you know, we know that hospitalizations and deaths are dropping um, in the city, but rural parts of the state, uh, that's where cases are actually rising. Um, and you were talking about vaccination levels, but you know, how much of this is also due to continued vaccine hesitancy? Well, we still have a lot of heterogeneity in the information that people receive about vaccines. The misinformation and disinformation is actually targeted at some of our minority communities. Sometimes it's targeted toward Republicans and people who don't necessarily consider themselves to be minorities. Sometimes it's targeted at people more in rural communities. But that targeted disinformation is costing lives. This is a safe and effective vaccine. And so when you have a group of people, even if it's just a book club that shares misinformation and bad information and dissuades other people from getting vaccinated, it takes a toll. And Dr. Landon, also, what are your expectations for winter um, and what can we expect out of flu season? So I think we're going to see a bump of infections and the, the amount that that bump impacts us in Illinois, in Chicago, in your neighborhood and your zip code is going to depend a lot on how vaccinated that group of people is. And so I think we'll see a bump. It's up to us to decide how big it's going to be. Influenza, on the other hand, I'm really hoping that we can keep our masks on throughout the winter because as we come indoors, unless you need to have your mask off for something, it's really just not that inconvenient to wear it and that will help decrease the spread of influenza as well cleaning your hands and um and sort of keeping distance when you need to when you're unmasked is going to also make a difference for influenza i honestly don't know what to expect with respect to influenza the southern hemisphere is usually a great predictor for us but last year the southern hemisphere um, especially australia was still in large-scale lockdowns and South, South America didn't have much influenza, but they were still seeing a lot of COVID. So it's a very difficult to know what to expect in our communities as we open up more, as the cases come down, people let down their guard a little bit, um, but uh, surely, it's still important to get your flu shot. Yeah, and surely we're gonna find out what the season is gonna be like shortly. Uh, Dr. Figueroa, before we let the both of you go, you know, one group of people who are not vaccinated, people under the age of 12, how much of a difference uh, do you think that the expected emergency use authorization from the FDA for, for that age group, uh, how much of a difference do you expect that will make? Wow, it's going to be so impactful um, because it's really going to help us uh, expand and, and help with gaps in a lot of the congregate settings that we're experiencing. Sending kids back to school has been heartbreaking for my patients and for um, a lot of members of our community, so it will be wonderful. Hopefully, the communities will take advantage of the vaccine because there are huge disparities in Chicago in uptake, but hopefully we can keep getting the message out. Okay, thanks to the both of you for finding time for us tonight, Dr. Emily Landon and Dr. Evelyn Figueroa for joining us. Thanks, take care. Right. And now Paris, back to you. All right, Brandis, thanks very much. Now there's some trouble brewing at Southwest Airlines as the low cost carriers had to cancel nearly 200 flights since yesterday in Chicago alone. This comes at a time when airlines are issuing vaccine mandates for U.S. employees, some with no testing alternative option. Also adding to airway disruption are unruly customers resisting compliance with COVID protocols. Last week, President Biden addressed this in his visit to Chicago. Well, I've instructed the Justice Department to make sure that we deal with the violence on aircraft coming from those people who are taking issues. We're going to deal with that. And here to discuss recent airline disruptions, vaccine mandates, and more are transportation specialist Joseph Sweeterman, professor in the School for Public Service at DePaul University and the Department of Public Policy, and Dennis Tager, an American Airlines pilot and spokesman for the Allied Pilots Association. Welcome both of you back to Chicago tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, um, I'll start with you. Well, let's start with this Southwest issue. Cancellations all throughout the weekend. More cancellations today. Southwest blaming it on weather. Uh, what exactly is going on at the airline? Yeah, I've been watching the aviation a long time. This is really a unique case because there's not a, a single thing they're pointing to that caused this. I, I do think if you were to really uh, cut to the chase, the airlines are cutting it really close on labor right now. They're facing shortages. They're facing uh, uh, resignations. And then you throw in uh, an unexpected event like this and things we found with Southwest caught them off guard. They spiraled and uh, probably suggests there's some employee morale uh, at play here as well. Uh, Dennis Tager, I mean, there's reports of a possible sick out. Are you hearing anything like that from your colleagues over at that uh, airline that that's what's happening? 
Well, as Professor Sweetman accurately says, this is a convergence of, uh, as we see it, management failures to run the airline uh, for some of the reasons that the professor brought up. So, uh, no, all the indications are, even from Southwest and from the pilot union there, we represent the American pilots, is this is nothing to do with the mandate. We watched American have these troubles through the summer. When the weather hits, they can't recover very efficiently. Um, matter of fact, they're, they're horrible at it. And um, uh, we, we've called that out. We'll continue to call that out as we look at the winter months. Um, and we'll be very public about it because we don't have the time to fail at serving our passengers during this recovery. And certainly staffing shortages hitting a number of industries in the coming months uh, mean holiday travel as well. All right, Joe, let's talk about the current vaccine mandates. Uh, airlines like United, American Southwest, do require the vaccine for employees because they're federal contractors in addition to being private carriers. Is this the way, the right way to go? Yeah, I did. Th I do think uh, uh, I somebody support vaccine mandates and think overall they're a good idea. I do think it's unfortunate though that uh, the private airlines got snared in the federal contractor laws, but it really is sort of a, a very uh, public service oriented approach to them being contractors in times of war and so forth, providing equipment. So they don't feel like contractors. And I think that's perhaps why some of the resentment uh, is building up among labor that they, uh, they alone are forced to get vaccinations without those other alternatives. And of course the Biden mandate, which could affect all industries, uh, could level the playing field, you might say, and make everybody get vaccinated. But right now, airline workers are still a little bit uh, singled out, you might say. Right, right. So other airlines that are not federal contractors as well, they're not subject to that federal mandate. Uh, Dennis, we know at American that pilots and other employees must be fully vaccinated by November 24th. How are pilots uh, and other employees reacting to this? Well, I mean, the good news is we have 70% or 10,000 of our pilots vaccinated. The bad news is 30% or 4,000 pilots are still standing by. So um, this inconsistency that was just brought up by the professor is dead on. You know, you buy a ticket on American or United, the, the airline here in Chicago. We have an airline as well. But uh, they, they have regional affiliates that feed them. Some of them are owned. Some of them are just through uh, partnerships. Those carriers, like the professor mentioned, are not federally mandated because they're not contractors. So... This, this imagery that we've got everybody uh, vaccinated is really not consistent. And that's what we're calling out on this. We're not calling out the vaccine at all. We're just calling out the rather uh, uh, inconsistent way that it's being doled out and very concerned about the approaching holiday. And we're just, we're actually looking for a pause and extension on this. We've offered up either uh, a testing for natural immunity and or frequent testing like all other companies will likely be uh, subjected to because uh, it's worked on airplanes. They've been safe through the pandemic. I know I did my first interview, I think, with you at O'Hare with a right. mask we on. Did. Um, it was very I remember empty, that very well. Very, very empty O'Hare terminal. So what you're, what you're mentioning there is uh, you buy a ticket for American, you might not be actually filing, flying American, but one of those uh, contracting airlines that are not subject to the federal mandate. So a lot of confusion there. And let's, let's hear from an American Airlines uh, flight attendant we spoke with who is hoping for an alternative option. I am for medical freedom for your decisions. And so for me, I think it's difficult to follow that. And also just in the workplace has been really like divided ever since it came out as far as people, your coworkers asking you if you're vaccinated or not. And I just feel like that's a personal decision. And I am honestly getting ready to be fired so I am not going to comply with the mandate. I am prepared to lose my job and my income and all my flying benefits and everything for it. So, Joe, you heard Dennis mention 30 percent of uh, pilots uh, in his union not vaccinated. You, you hear from this employee. Could there be a critical staffing shortage uh, for holiday travel? That's the big fear. This is really a tough one because we know that vaccines are a, a good thing, but but it's developed into something that's uh, kind of rippled through the airline uh, uh, staff of, of morale issues. And I think in Southwest, so famous for being responsive and having labor that can switch between tasks, you know, was brought to its knees this weekend by lots of factors. And, and no question that uh, the workforce feels battered right now. I mean, there were layoffs. They were, uh, of course, uh, uh, unruly passengers now on board with the mask, the feeling of tension. So I really hope uh, uh, that, you know, the as we approach the holidays, 
uh, we, we get things back on track. But it's, it's pretty scary right now yeah. for the airlines. And as we said, a critical shortage of workers in so many industries. Uh, Dennis, we got to get, and there's so much we could talk about with this, but we got to get to the issue of scuffles in the air. It's pretty bad over the last year to 18 months. Uh, give us a sense of how bad is it uh, you're hearing from pilots and flight attendants? Well, it's much worse than it was before this, but the good news is that it is very infrequent, but when it happens, it's it's very violent, and uh, we're pleased to hear President Biden call on the Department of Justice. All of the unions, not just my union, but all the unions of the airlines sent a letter to uh, Attorney General Garland saying we need criminal procedures uh, uh, taken on these, these issues. The FAA stepped up, levied heavy fines, made it very public, but we need that next step because the most important thing is you're distracting the crew. You're distracting me in the cockpit. I've got to divert my attention, and especially if there's violence back there. And we're at 35,000 feet at near the speed of sound. I can't just say, okay, enough, get out. So this is why it's, it's, it's got to be a zero tolerance, and uh, it's got to have consequences that go beyond just the money uh, because you're putting on my airplane 170 plus of my crew in danger uh, if you decide to come unhinged for whatever reason. And majority of them are, are max, mask-related, <clears throat> but it's the way it is, you know, even when I put it on. It Sweets with a mission, so please stay with us. I come from a people that not only found a way to survive through the most horrific circumstances, but they thrived. I could not save one of the boys of color in my own life. If my family could be exposed to this horror, then really it could happen to anyone. We are truly all in this together. And there's much more ahead on the program, including a look at the resignation of the Chicago Park District's CEO. But first, a bakery on the north side is helping adults with different abilities build life and work skills, while also providing the Lincoln Square community with sweet treats. The shop recently revamped its space and expanded its hours to the weekend. You look like a chef. <laughs> there we go, Alexis. Alexis Long has a passion for baking. And thanks to a culinary program at the Lincoln Square nonprofit Gateway to Learning, Long is working toward her goal of turning her hobby into a career. To be a French pastry chef and then maybe move up to cakes. Gateway provides life skills and workforce training to adults with intellectual challenges and different abilities. One of the organization's sweetest offerings is a bakery on Lincoln Avenue, Dorothy's Sweet Shop. Well, I make the, the cookies and the, the, the kolaskis I get. I wipe the tables, sweep the floor. The organization's participants help keep the shop running, from baking the klotchkis and potato chip cookies to taking customers' orders and cashing them out. How about we would mm, the customer, like what they want to buy? The intent is to, to even for um, the trainees that are in Dorothy's Sweet Shop to have that hands-on experience so that they can go apply to other um, bakeries, other food establishments in, in the Chicagoland area. Diane Lima says the impact Gateway and Dorothy's Sweet Shop have had on her brother, Billy Kochkel, has been profound. He gets up in the morning, he has his breakfast, he takes his uh, sandwich and he walks to work every day. That's how he feels. He feels like he's doing the same thing his dad did every morning. And then five peanut butter chocolate pretzels. Alexis Long's dad, Jim, says Dorothy's has helped his daughter build both culinary and life skills. One of the neat things about working in the cafe is the development of social skills, working with money, where some things that have always been a little difficult uh, for Alexis, but uh, she's developed great confidence. Dorothy's Sweet Shop has been around since 1986, but this fall, the bakery revamped its storefront, flipping the color scheme from orange to pastels and replacing old countertops and display cases with those donated by local bakery, Vani. We had closed stores due to the pandemic, and we were sitting on a bunch of custom equipment. And I um, didn't want it just to go anywhere or sit in storage or sell it just to anybody. Vani and Dorothy's Sweet Shop began working together three years ago. Today, some of Vani's pastries are sold at the bakery, and customers can pick up orders here, too. And the partnership doesn't end there. Alexis Long is Vinny's newest employee. Alexis came in, um, same thing, we had our Phil macarons, 
you know, entry level things that any other entry level pastry cook would do. And she passed flying colors. <laughs> so we offered her a job immediately. She was on cloud nine as a result of that. Uh, she's very dedicated to the job. Long splits her time between Dorothy's and Vinny and says she's enjoying every minute of working toward her goal. I love it because I'm starting to be a French pastry chef there. In addition to baked goods, Dorothy's also sells homemade dog biscuits. The shop is located on Lincoln Avenue and it's open Monday through Saturday. You can visit our website to learn more. And now Paris, back to you. Tasty treats there. All right, Brandis, thanks very much. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, more on why Southwest Airlines canceled more than a quarter of its scheduled flights yesterday. That and more business news from Cranes. The Park District's longtime CEO is out over his handling of a culture of sexual abuse within the lifeguarding ranks. What's the secret to super aging? Northwestern researchers get a major grant to keep studying brain and cognitive aging. The White Sox storm back in their playoff series against the Houston Astros. We look ahead to tomorrow's must win game four. And we introduce you to a softball player and coach who is determined to help other girls follow in her cleats and go pro. But first, some more of today's top stories. Much of the Chicago area is under a tornado watch until 9 this evening. This after most of the area has seen persistent showers and thunderstorms throughout the day. The National Weather Service even issued a marine warning due to the threat of water spouts occurring on Lake Michigan. The severe weather, of course, postponed today's must-win Sox home playoff game until tomorrow, and we're going to have more on that in just a bit. First Lady Jill Biden is set to travel to Chicago tomorrow. Biden is planning to accompany Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia to events at Daly College on the South Side and the National Museum of Mexican Art in Pilsen. The visit is part of National Hispanic Heritage Month and is billed as a series of conversations and listening sessions with the Hispanic community. It will be Biden's first visit to Chicago as First Lady. And now a look at today's business news. Brandis. Paris, thank you. Northwestern University names the first woman to ever serve as its president. Insurance company Allstate is embracing hybrid work and selling its Northbrook headquarters and why Southwest Airlines canceled over a quarter of its flights yesterday. Here to go behind the headlines is A.D. Quigg, politics and government reporter with Crane Chicago Business. Welcome back, A.D. So let's talk about the Northwestern president first. Who is she and where does she come from? So Rebecca Blank is the chancellor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She will start at Northwestern next summer. Uh, she's also worked at the University of Michigan, Princeton, in the Commerce Department for Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. Um, her big to-dos, she says, are boosting research funding, improving the residential experience for students, and encouraging them to get out of the bubble of Evanston. Um, on that research funding bit, UW-Madison brought in $1.5 billion in sponsored research funding last year. Uh, so Northwestern has room to grow there. It got just under $900 million last year. And like any university president, fundraising to bolster the endowment is going to be a big deal. Okay, and she'll take office in August of uh, 22 after the current president leaves. So we'll be watching to see what she does there. So Allstate selling that headquarters in Northbrook. What does this say about the future of hybrid work? Basically, that is here to stay. And when you acknowledge that, it doesn't make a ton of sense to keep all 1.9 million square feet of real estate on 186 acres. It's just a ton of space when your workers don't want to come into the office. Um, the company says they'll still keep a significant presence in the Chicago area, but this is just an interesting wrinkle in the big conversation that we've had in recent years about the, the future of suburban office parks. Before, there was, it was all about companies moving to downtown Chicago. Now it's about downsizing to accommodate workers who like being home. Um, even downtown, big office space, and companies like United are being sublet. It's definitely something to watch. Something to keep an eye on for sure. And Southwest cancels a quarter of its flights. What's going on there? In short, uh, storms and a shortage of pilots and flight attendants. This has been a big disruptor of the past four days, impacted more than 3,000 flights. Uh, the company is the biggest carrier out of Midway. The chief operating officer of the company, um, Mike Vanderber, told employees the company needs a bigger staffing cushion and that the aviation industry is still very fragile right now. Um, some of the early talk was that it was pilots staging a stick out over COVID shot mandates, that federal mandate from President Biden. Um, the head of the Pilots Association said that it is not part of the problem. They're not actually allowed to take any job action to resolve labor disputes. 
uh, but the union is asking the court two blocks southwest from carrying out that mandate. Uh, deadline for shots is December 8th. But the bigger issue is pilots, flight attendants, and ground workers are being overworked, and there are not enough to fill a lot of the vacancies that Southwest wanted to fill. They set up an early um, goal to fill 500 positions at the company, and they are still struggling to meet that. So as a result, flights are getting impacted. And obviously, uh, thousands of people uh, experiencing some delays as that's happening. Uh, A.D. Quigg at Crane Chicago Business, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Chicago's longtime Park District CEO was out of a job after accusations that he was slow to take action against a pervasive culture of sexual harassment and abuse. But that may not be the only change if critics have their way. Amanda Vinicky joins us now. Amanda, this is a case that's been building for a while now. Yeah, Brandis, you've got threats by supervisors, harassment at pools and at beaches, sexual abuse, propositions in front of children even, of lifeguards for sex. Now, victims who had worked for the Park District under Kelly wrote letters to him describing circumstances such as these, and he wrote back that he would act. But the probe has dragged on and whistleblowers' frustrations with those delays. And what critics say is a deep culture of systemic issues has grabbed public attention in recent months due to reporting by WBEZ's Dan Mihalopoulos. WBEZ now reporting that state's attorney Kim Fox is looking into the matter as well. Now, back in the summer, Kelly vowed he was taking all of it seriously. And I continue to do everything in my power to root out the bad actors and bad behavior. I understand the frustration with the time it has taken to look into these complaints. Investigations never happen fast enough. But I assure every person who has been impacted by this case that this is top of mind for me, and it has been since the first day I learned about it. At the time, he said that he was going to see this all through, and to that end, he appeared to have the support of Mayor Lori Lightfoot, who last month stood alongside him at a park ribbon cutting. Now, she didn't actually appoint him to this position. That was Mayor Rahm Emanuel, who put Kelly permanently in the post in 2011, but Lightfoot did keep him on. On Friday, the Park District's Board of Commissioners did meet privately. Lightfoot issued a statement at the time saying that she had urged the commissioners to have him out to oust him, citing a lack of urgency and accountability. The failings of the current Park District administration's response to new allegations of harm to a child persists and simply cannot be tolerated one day longer, she said in a statement. Now, the board at the time did not actually force him out, but by Saturday, Kelly had tendered his resignation effective immediately. It has been an honor to steward this extraordinary organization for the past 10 years. It has also been an honor to serve Chicagoans as public servant for the past 27 years. I have always had the best interests of our patrons and our employees at heart, he said in his resignation letter. Alderman Scott Wagusback was first to call for Kelly to step down. Since a handful of other members of the city council have joined that call, among them Alderwoman Rosanna Rodriguez Sanchez, who says it felt like for a long time, Kelly was given the benefit of the doubt. It's incredible that after the mayor asked for his resignation, it happened almost immediately. So this could have actually happened before. And, and it is outrageous that it didn't. Um, I think that there is enough evidence at this point and that, that points to the fact that there has been a lot of misconduct, that there has been a lot of damage that has been done. She says the mayor should have taken action against Kelly previously, despite a clause predating the Lightfoot administration that could have put taxpayers on the hook for breaking Kelly's contract early. Now, others have questioned why more members of the city council haven't spoken out and even why it took so long for many of those who did to do so. I think that there is a political culture in Chicago um, that is a lot about preserving relationships, that it's a lot about like waiting and seeing so that you don't get in the wrong side of so-and-so. And, and that can be very dangerous and it can be an enemy of good government. She says that is something that should change in Chicago. Now you have friends of the park president, Juanita Irizarry, saying she wishes that Kelly had been pushed out sooner. She cites culture of misogyny at the park district, the harassment of lifeguards and abuse, 
but also other questions of judgment. Friends of the Parks has long been concerned that the leadership of Mike Kelly did not bring an emphasis on equity across the park district. Um, and that in fact, maybe he didn't even understand what that term means. Um, we have seen real lack of transparency in a lot of cases. She says Kelly was too focused on revenue, citing, for example, when the board quietly brokered a deal this summer with Amazon to install pickup lockers at public parks to the consternation of the public. Now, Friends of the Park has other frustrations with park district leadership, though she says Friends of the Port Friends of the Parks, that is, has not specifically discussed whether the board should go after commissioners on Friday did not take action against Kelly. We have had a lot of conversation about the Board of Commissioners of the Park District being a rubber stamp board, one that really just follows orders from above or from below in the case of Mike Kelly, um, and that it is not accountable to the citizenry of this city. Um, so we think this is a great opportunity to think about what changes need to be made, both in the composition and the construct of this Board of Commissioners. So that could mean exploring moving to an elected board mechanisms for greater oversight from the city council, given that now the park district is a separate entity or prioritizing commissioners with expertise in parks and recreation rather than commissioners who she says are really appointed for their political connections or campaign contributions. Now, the board currently helmed by Avis Lavelle, who had served as park uh, as press secretary, that is, to Mayor Richard M. Dane and also a press secretary to President Bill Clinton's campaign. WTTW did reach out trying to speak with her, but a park spokesperson said that she was not available. Likewise, other commissioners did not respond to a request for comments or an interview. But over the weekend, the board and Lavelle issuing a statement saying that the commissioners will consult with the mayor to get going on appointing an interim CEO, one with a heightened level of attention to issues and concerns confronting the Chicago Park District, and that is its highest priority, the commissioner said. At this point, you have various investigations still ongoing and the board meeting on Wednesday. By the way, also did reach out to Mayor Lightfoot's office and her spokesperson offered no additional comment from the one we received on Friday again that led to Kelly's resignation. With that, Brenda, back to you. Amanda, thank you. And now to Paris Shots and more on a wild night of baseball. Paris. Brandis, afternoon storms have forced today's Sox Astros playoff game to be postponed until tomorrow, but the players and fans no doubt are still thunderstruck after last night's four hour and 27 minute marathon victory by the Sox in a must win game three. Did last night's 12 to 6 victory turn the tide for the Southsiders? Joining us to relive last night's excitement and look ahead to tomorrow's game four is Darren Jackson, who teams up with Len Casper on White Sox radio broadcast. Darren is, of course, former White Sox outfielder, played for a number of teams, including the one on Chicago's north side. Darren Jackson, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Paris, it's a pleasure to be here. Yes, last night's game was a little bit long, but you know what? Had we played, we would have been ready to go today. And, and but you, you get this day off. So first of all, have you you've been associated with this team for a long time? Have you ever seen guaranteed rate field rocking like that? Um, not to that level. Um, if if you consider all things, which means here we are in the postseason, first actual playoff game in front of fans since 2008, and it's the Astros who right now are not America's favorite team. So. <laughs> We had that blackout, you know, everybody in black, isolated orange shirt and jersey here or there. Felt sorry for them, to be honest with you, but the place was shaking, it was rocking, and uh, it was definitely the place to be. C certainly Sox fans let uh, the Astros uh, know about their displeasure with some of their indiscretions in past years. All right, so before we look ahead to tomorrow, the Sox were down 5-1. to one. Their bats had been struggling for the first two games. What finally awakened them, uh, and, and can they keep it going? You know what? I, I think what really awakened them was the fact that they had the right approaches. Um, and then you think about the one particular play, Yasmani Grandal. Um, you know, it's not by design that, that he was running on the grass other than the fact that it's just a brilliant play. And he does have the right of way there. I think he knew that, realized that, didn't do any overt move to try and create a problem. That completely turned the game in our favor from there. 
some good things happen, not to mention the two-run home run he hit. And obviously, changing a pitcher in the middle of a bat is just something that's so old school. It doesn't really happen anymore, but Dusty Baker did it. He put his pitcher in a position to come in with a 2-0 count. Count worked the three and one, and Larry Garcia absolutely crushed the three one fastball exactly like he should. So those are the points of the game to me that really turned things in the favor of the White Sox. Knocked it straight out to center field, and of course you were referring to that controversial call uh, earlier in the game that Dusty Baker thought should have gone the other way. All right, so tomorrow uh, Carlos Rodon takes him out. He's had some uh, injury problems. What's his status, and what do you expect from him tomorrow? Well, he says he's ready to go as of yesterday, so I don't think there's really a concern about his health um the key is going to be the velocity is it going to be at 95 98 99 90. um but one thing i saw with carlos last time he was out and i'd never seen him do this is he established that he can pitch at a lower velocity if he did it at 90 miles an hour for five innings absolutely shut down an opponent giving up just one hit he looked great his breaking stuff was good and usually when his velocity is down he's vulnerable and that's not the case he was not he was pitching for the first time he wasn't just trying to blow guys away so that tells me that he seems to be settled into the fact that he can work with higher velocity or lower and he can figure out how to get opponents out and that's going to be important because the astros are one of the smartest teams in baseball you can't just go out there thinking oh i'm just going to lob it up there and surprise them they'll be ready for whatever he has to offer so he's going to have to execute so changing speeds are really important all right there's still some controversy of course you know about the comments that Sox reliever ryan tapera made last night seeming to insinuate that at the astros home ballpark they're still engaging in some kind of sketchy activity possibly stealing signs like they got caught doing a few years ago what do you make of those comments um, obviously, Ryan can say whatever he wants. I'm, I, I think he's very opinionated and he believes in what he says. But at the same time, look, I, I come from a, a, an era where everybody was stealing signs in the sense that if the catcher was not coding his signs properly and there's a runner on second base and they got him, that was on the catcher, do a better job. Or if the pitcher was grabbing his ball a certain way in his glove and showing it to the runner at second base, that's their job to hide how they're doing this, mask the pitches. Um, no technology. I don't believe in that. Don't try and cheat. Don't sit out there with binoculars and a white sock. Somebody in Sarah Phil, hey, fastball's coming. Not that kind of stuff. Uh, just if you are not good enough to, to kind of mask what you're trying to do to the batters, that's shame on you. You should be good enough to deceive the batters. And, and by the way, if you think you go ahead and these guys are getting your signs, don't tell them. Let them think they still have the signs. Set them up. Pitch them backwards. Make them think they got it right, and then they're going to be shocked. When all of a sudden they don't have it right, they're going to go, whoa, that fastball almost got me in the coconut. That was supposed to be a slider down in the way. So that's how all you right. really counter first place. Play, play, play the chess game there. Yeah, like you said, a lot of these things have been part of the game for a long time. All right, so uh, Lance McCullers going for uh, Houston tomorrow. He's had the Sox number. He's had almost everybody's number. Uh, what, what do the Sox have to do to, to get on the board early against him? Well, I think the number one thing for us is we have to lay off the pitches out of the strike zone. Now, look, I know from experience that's year seven that he done because his pitches look like fastballs and we're hunting fastballs in the first place. So you're going to have to look location. You're going to have to make him. I was talking to Ron Kittle about this today, the old school way. He has a great curveball and a great slider. It looks like fastballs down the middle. You can't swing at anything that's down the middle. You've got to make those pitches start right at your hip right at your body, and then you'll know they'll end up in the hitting spot. So it's really a discipline. If they have that discipline early in the game, we'll go deeper in counts. He'll fall behind in counts if we're laying off, and then that gives us somewhat of an advantage. Look, we're hoping fourth time's a charm because we've seen him three times this year, and things have not gone well. I would assume at this time that we haven't got him figured out by now. We're really going to have some problems anyway. All right, uh, Darren Jacks, we all look forward to that uh, game four tomorrow. Must win, and then... Game five, uh, back in Houston, knock on wood. I know that uh, we'll get there. Thank you so much for joining us on your, on your day off here. Appreciate it. Paris, a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. You bet. And now, Brandis, we toss it back to you. Paris, Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. On average, a person with Alzheimer's lives four to eight years after diagnosis, 
but can live as long as 20 years, depending on other factors. Now, that's all according to the Alzheimer's Association. Although there is still no cure, researchers at Northwestern University are looking into how the brain might be able to protect against Alzheimer's. The university just announced a major financial boost to promote further cognitive and brain health research, a $20 million grant from the National Institute on Aging. Joining us is the scientist leading this group of researchers, neuroscientist Emily Rogalski, associate director of the Mesalem, excuse me, Center for Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer Disease. Thank you so much for joining us. So, Emily, you, your research has coined the term su superager. First, tell us what that is. Sure, thanks for having me here today. I'm excited to tell you about our super agers. So it's a kind of funny, quirky term, but it, it stands for individuals who are over age 80, but have memory performance at least as good as individuals in our 50s and 60s. So to kind of back up, um, we think about memory and how memory uh, works as we age. We know that um, our memory tends to peak in our 20s or 30s, uh, maybe 40s. Um, and then there's some decline that happens after that as we age. That's part of what's thought to be the normal process of aging. So an uh, individual who is in their 80s um, has different normal or average uh, memory performance compared to someone in their 50s and 60s. So we're looking for people who are over age 80 who have that outstanding memory performance. You can think of them as that neighbor or that friend that you know, um, who you say, oh, you'd never know that they were 80, they act like they're 50 or they act like they're 30. Um, these are the types of individuals that we were seeking to find. And we're, I wanna come back to some of the behaviors of those super agers in a second as well. Um, but as we mentioned, you just received this $20 million grant from the National Institute on Aging. How is that grant gonna further your research? Well, we've been really excited to do this research on superagers for more than a decade now. And the idea comes um, from, from a lot of vantage points. One is that we're a, an Alzheimer's disease research center. And one of the ways that we can understand Alzheimer's disease is by inviting um, participants and to study the neurobiology of Alzheimer's disease itself and try to understand um, uh, what can we do to, to change that trajectory? Another path that we can take is identifying people we call who are super agers um, who seem to avoid uh, that change in, in memory or thinking ability. So these are potentially protective factors. We've been doing this research, as I mentioned, for more than a decade now, and um, that's all mostly been locally here in the north in the Chicago land area. This grant gives us the opportunity to extend the scope of science that we're doing um, and also uh, really extend across the United States and Canada so that we can uh, find superagers outside of the Chicago land area. So you'll be increasing uh, to a new consortium uh, about what 500 participants that you're adding up yes. to? Yes, exactly. So we'll be enrolling 500 participants um, across uh, five different sites, inclu um, including Wisconsin and um, Georgia and Canada um, and, and Michigan. So we're, we're excited to expand um, both physically and in the science that we're able to cover. Absolutely. So your research has shown that a few habits of super agers, uh, they, are, they continue to lead an active lifestyle and they challenge themselves mentally as well. They are social butterflies and they enjoy the occasional beverage, a glass of wine or a nightcap. Um, what physical characteristics of their brains have you noted and uh, how does that translate to their cognitive performance? Sure, so we, you've mentioned um, some of kind of our initial observations in this group, but when we look at the biology of superagers, um, one way we, that we can measure the health of the brain is through um, MRI scans. And there we can look at the thickness or the outer layer of the brain that gives us a proxy measure of the health of the brain. We see that in normal or average aging, the brain tends to shrink um, with time. And that shrinkage is associated with changes in our thinking ability. What we look at in the superagers is that, uh, does their brain look more like their 80 year old peers who they share the same chronologic age with, or more like the 50 year old peers who they share memory performance with? And what we found is that the superagers look brains look more like those 50 year old brains than they do like the 80 year old brains. And in fact, there was a region in the anterior cingulate that was thicker in the superagers than it was even in the 50 year olds. 
We've then extended those findings to look under the microscope um, from superagers who, uh, after they've passed away, have donated their brain at the time of death. And there we can look for other cellular, cellular and molecular factors and found um, that there's unique features there as well. So your research discusses successful cognitive aging for curious viewers and inquiring minds. How do you recommend that people um, take care of their cognitive health as they age? So our research is, is in and among um, a great span of research that's looking at these questions of how do we optimize cognitive aging. And so we're learning bit by bit in this from the super agers um, what they can tell us. But some of those things that you mentioned earlier about staying active, um, having a good outlook on life, um, those things are important. Um, and we've, we've shown that scientifically um, with other studies. In our research, we're really digging into those protective factors. And through this consortium, we'll be better able to answer those questions because we'll have a greater depth and breadth of the science that can be done. Okay, something to keep an eye on for sure. Emily Rogowski, thank you so much for joining us and best of luck. Thank you very much. Up next, a passionate athlete who doubted whether she could go pro. But first, a look at the weather. It's Hispanic Heritage Month, and tonight we're highlighting a woman, an accomplished athlete, who is proud of her Mexican roots. She shared with Chicago Tonight's Joanna Hernandez what drove her to play professional softball. I didn't think that I was going to be a professional softball player. Um, not even in college did I think I was going to be a professional softball player because I... I didn't know if the option would be there for me. Mexican-American Abby Ramirez has been playing sports since she was a kid. I definitely come from an athletic family. I mean, my, all of my aunts and uncles played sports, especially on my dad's side. And my grandpa has been one of my biggest cheerleaders since I was, you know, this tall and playing 10U. Illinois High School Player of the Year at Trinity High School. As a high school senior was Abby Ramirez. Oh, that'll get through! At 26 years old, the Chicago native has gone on to play with the Chicago Bandits for two seasons and then proceeded to compete with Athletes Unlimited, a softball league for pro athletes, where players are drafted for different teams each week. For Athletes Unlimited to be here, it's been, you know, such a great opportunity for all of us as female athletes, but um, especially in the softball community because um, we, are, we were lacking that professional presence and to be able to play beyond college has been amazing. And now I've been, you know, able to play with teammates who I've played against in college. Ramirez, who also has Irish heritage on her mother's side, is making a mark for other girls to pursue the game she fell in love with. There's tons of little girls um, super excited to, to get our signatures, and that's um, ha has been really cool. And then also I do lessons in the area. So on, during the offseason, I've worked with a ton of young players. To me, it's very rewarding. And, you know, I, I always tell them I started in their shoes. So if, you know, if I can get here, so can they. The young player who grew up on the southwest side of Chicago played at the University of Michigan, where she got her degree in communications and went on to pursue her master's in sports administration from Northwestern. I played high school games here, so um, to be back as a professional has been really cool and kind of a full circle moment for me. So that's definitely a couple times when I was like, wow, like this is, I, I've, you know, I've dreamed about this for so long and now I, I'm here doing it. And it's a connection she shares with her family that Ramirez says keeps her grounded and connected to her roots. When I played with the Chicago Bandits, they all came out to a game and I swear you saw like 36, 37, I think it was the total number, but it was approaching 40 um, Ramirez shirts in the stands and we all got a picture afterwards and um, that was really you know special to me and every time I go in the game, they're screaming their heads off. As she wrapped up the season at Athletes Unlimited, Ramirez has her eyes set on coaching, hoping to help other women get opportunities to go pro. My college coach, Carol Hutchins, at the University of Michigan, she has been such a huge, you know, mentor for me and, and had such an impact on my life that, you know, I would hope to do the same for someone in college as well. Throughout her journey growing up as a second generation Latina, she says she's proud to be representing her heritage on and off the field. I think it's great for young um, young players who, you know, come from, you know, either Mexican background or Hispanic background, whatever it is, to be able to see us representing and to see, 
you know, people that look like them on that stage, and then that just motivates them and inspires them. So I think it's, it's really important. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Joanna Hernandez. And Ramirez has recently been named assistant coach for DePaul University's softball team. And we're back in a minute to wrap things up. 23 seconds. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Monday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Bruce Willis isn't involved, but a new NASA mission aims to show it can deflect an asteroid bound for Earth. And three local artists bring the many colors of baseball to vibrant life for the Chicago White Sox. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals. That's a school of hard knocks on finding your roots.